to you by Golf Pride. Good morning. Welcome in to Morning Drive on the weekend. Nice to have you with us. I'm Gary Williams. Very pleased, as always, to spend this time alongside the likes of Matt Adams. You can listen to his great radio program, Fairways of Life, Monday through Friday, anywhere in the world. Jaime Diaz, one of the great writers in the game of golf, one of the great writers really in the world of sports. And, of course, John Cook, 11-time winner on the PGA Tour, 10 more wins on PGA Tour champions. And, guys, when we look at our history, the history of the game that we cover, 150 years ago today, Harry Varden came into this world off the south southern coast of England, the Isle of Jersey, and on and off the golf course, if you consider his impact on the game, even today, it is significant. Technique and style, and also what he then did in the game, in its infancy, six times he won the Open Championship, something nobody else has come close to achieving. And we sit here a century later, that sixth win included, in addition to that, winning the 1900 U.S. Open. That was the sixth edition of the U.S. Open, and he was a member of that 1974 inaugural World Golf Hall of Fame class. So 150 years to the day we sit here. And Jaime, let me start with you, because the infancy of somebody's career, but really the beginnings uh, of somebody's life and their advent and their progression in the game. Tell us a little bit more about Harry Varden and his progression in the game of golf. Well, Harry Varden came out of intense po poverty out of the Channel Islands there in Jersey, totally isolated from golf until his family was displaced by the building of the Royal Jersey Golf Club when he was seven years old. And, you know, that was a big hardship for the family. But so Harry went to caddy as an eight year old. And then that's when he first noticed the game and started swinging a little bit and co copying guys and built a club out of, uh, you know, a, a, a branch of wood, but very rudimentary. But he definitely had a kind of swing that already as a young guy was up, more upright than the St. Andrews sort of classic swing that everybody else in England and Scotland had. It was his own swing. It turned out to end up revolutionizing the game when Harry first went to the British Open. As a 23-year-old, he was already the most accurate player in the field, and old Tom Morris picked up on it. He just had this amazing motion that was so easy and natural and really did change the game as more players started to swing upright because of him. He also had an amazing temperament, and a lot of that was just born of the hardship that he under, underwent as a kid. Uh, you know, he, he went into servitude at, from the ages of 12 to 17 and actually stopped playing golf all that time. He became a golfer again when he became a gardener and for the captain of the golf club there in Jersey, and he gave him encouragement to actually go play. By the time Harry was 20, he'd only played golf about 20 times in his life in terms of playing a round of golf. But again, the temperament was such a, a, one of resiliency and calm, and he just had a tremendous ability to focus as well. So it's one of those origin stories, much like Sam Snead or maybe Lee Trevino, their own without any instruction, completely self-made, golf geniuses who revolutionized the game. And, and Harry Varden is underrated in my mind in terms of the effect that he had on everybody that followed. John, as a player, give us perspective on six Open Championship wins. <laughs> yeah, after the Morris family, guys, uh, uh, Harry Varden was the next dominant player uh, of, of that time. Uh, the Open Championship sent tends to give... Uh, have a lot of multiple winners. You know, Peter Thompson five times, Tom Watson five times. Uh, it, he really put, I think, the Open Championship on the map. And you remember, after World War One, the U.S. players started to, you know, get on those ships and go over and 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 play in the Open Championship just to see if they could, you know, knock off Harry Varden and the uh, and the, the the great players from. Over, overseas. So you had Jock Hutchinson go over and, and, and win. Then Walter Hagen started to go over and won a couple of times. So like I said, the Open Championship pretty much has a lot of multiple winners over there. And I think he, you know, kind of set the stage that you could dominate in certain events. Uh, you, I mean, you have uh, you know, Walter Hagen then end up dominating the PGA. Uh, Ben Hogan, the U.S. Open, and then, of course, Tiger and, and, and Jack is dominating everything. So he could show you that you could dominate in sports. Uh, Nodal at the French Open. You got Kelly Slater, 11-time uh, world champion surfer. So I, I got to show athletes that you, know, you could dominate in sports, and I think Harry Barton was that first guy. 
You know, Matt, he was not alone. There were other great players of that time. Why do you think his impact likely prevailed over the others? Well, I think a lot of it had to do with vision. Uh, Harry Varden was the world's first global superstar. And as Cookie just alluded to, he wasn't the first star of golf in Great Britain, or if you please, golf in Europe. That would have been young Tom Morris, who dramatically changed the way that the game was played. Now, much of that was because of equipment changing, the golf ball changed so they could use more irons because the irons used to cut the featheries more often. But when Harry Varden came around, and this is what Jaime was talking about, had a much more upright swing. He was about 5'9", 155 pounds, but he had huge hands that did contribute to what he ultimately did with the grip as well. To win the Open six times and to this day to be the only guy that has done that, well, he was part of what they called the Great Triumph and two other guys that had five in J.H. Taylor and James Braid were that other two members of the Great Triumphant. There wouldn't be a third Great Triumphant, a second one in the case of superstars until you had, what, Nelson and Hogan and Sneed. One, an argument could be made for Jones, Sarazen, and Hagen in the early 1920s, I suppose. But he had this vision, Gary. He had this thought that he could take his game on a global basis. Three times he came to the United States and did tours very successfully. That had a tremendous amount to do with the growth of the game globally. Yes, the impact of Harry Varden should get more credit than what it actually does because he's one of the founding fathers of the game as we know it. Yeah, you know, Matt, you mentioned the grip and you mentioned the size of his hands and, and certain things that, that stand the test of time. And the Varden grip is one of those things. The technique in the game of golf is very particular. It's very individual. And, and by the way, that, that grip was not actually his in its origin. It was Johnny Laley, who was a, a great Scottish amateur. Uh, who was very good playing out of North Berwick, who was the one who really was the inventor of the grip. But because of Varden's uh, appeal globally, people attributed the grip to him. And it was one where you take the trailing hand and you take you know, that, that pinky finger of the trailing hand and, and lay it over the index finger of the lead hand and allow the, the thumb of that lead hand to work its way down the lifeline of the trail hand. And, and, and that's something where when you look at great players through time, one of our founders at Golf Channel, a lot of people believe that, that Arnold Palmer had one of the finest grips the game of golf has ever seen. People who, who pick up a golf club for the first time, naturally, most of them take that 10 finger grip, a lot of it because they're young and their hands are small. A lot of people thought, John Cook, that Arnold Palmer's hands appeared to be born to put that <laughs> club in its hand with that Varden grip. And I will tell you, you have a great grip, so much so <laughs> that Brandel Chambly, I know, played rounds with you at the Sony Open and went back to his hotel with his caddy and said, did you see the way that John could grip the club? It seems so natural. The Varden grip was important to you, was it not? It absolutely was. And you look at Ben Crenshaw and you look at, uh, at the, you know, the great Arnold Palmer and two best grips I, I, we've ever seen. I, I think they just melt on the, on the club. And in but my winter of my uh, sophomore year in college, uh, Ken Venturi suggested that I change my grip from an interlocking grip to the overlapping grip. He thought I was a little flippy-wristed college kid, and I didn't need to be flippy-wristed anymore. I needed to have a little more stability at the top of my golf swing. So, you know, basically, you know, I went from that interlocking grip and it, into the uh, Varden grip or the overlapping grip, and it just gave me, you know, a little more, uh, I'd say, stability in what I was trying to do. Um, felt a lot more solid. It took about, you know, took a good month of hitting golf balls inside uh, their French field house at, at Ohio State on the Ohio State campus to get comfortable with it. But by the time spring came along, uh, I, I felt like I had it down pretty well. And you know what? It changed, changed my swing a little bit. I got a little bit shorter, got a little more compact, felt a little more stability through the hitting area, and uh, basically um, got my ball striking onto a, a consistent level. Well, for the best players in the world, the Varden grip has been the prevailing grip. But some players have done fairly well with that interlock grip. Nicholas, Woods, McElroy mm -hmm. yeah. of present day.